Present. Senator, do we want to move on to statements or allow Senator McKim the minute before 2 p.m.? I'm happy to move the chamber. Let's meet Senator Cormann. Oh, sorry. Well, I was Senator McKim was due to speak uh, next on this bill. Um, I sought the leave of the chamber. Everyone appeared to agree. Senator McKim conceded that we could move on to to Senator Cormann making a statement. I understand by leave, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. I seek leave to provide an update to the Senate in relation to bushfires. Leave granted. Senator Cormann. Uh, I thank the Senate. Uh, Mr. President, over recent weeks, uh, Australians have been responding uh, to bushfires across the continent. Um, I would like to update the Senate on the fires as well as our response uh, in dealing with them. Uh, in relation to New South Wales, uh, dangerous fires continue to burn across New South Wales. More than 1.4 million uh, hectares uh, have been burned, and as of this morning, uh, there are more than 60 fires burning. Uh, more than uh, 1,900 firefighters and support personnel, along with 95 aircraft, have been battling these fires. Uh, tragically, four people have lost their lives, and dozens more have been injured, uh, including firefighters. Over the past two weeks, more than 555 houses have been destroyed and nearly 1,000 more outbuildings. In relation to Queensland, fires are continuing to burn in southeast Queensland. They have burned through 183,000 hectares since September. 55 fires are still burning across the state as we speak. 20 homes have been confirmed lost. More than 3,600 firefighters have been on the front line for more than two weeks along with aircraft. Nearly 50 firefighters have sustained injuries, including the pilot of a water bombing helicopter that crashed near Toowoomba. The situation is ever changing and a state of fire emergency has been declared across 42 local government areas. Uh, in Victoria, we've seen an easing in recent days following the catastrophic fire conditions of last Thursday. Uh, this easing should assist firefighters in coming days to battle the fires that continue to burn. Uh, last week, parts of South Australia experienced catastrophic fire conditions. 16 houses have been destroyed, along with 21 other structures, and four firefighters were injured. While conditions have eased, fires continue to burn across the southern parts of the state. In relation to Western Australia, we're, watching, uh, we're continuing to watch Western Australia closely. Uh, severe uh, fire dangers are forecast today uh, for the West Pilbara Coast, Ashburton uh, Inland and Gascoyne Inland districts. The government, through Emergency Management Australia, continues to work very closely with its state and territory counterparts, and we acknowledge tremendous national effort taking place. With firefighters travelling from every state and from New Zealand, as well as the United States and Canada, uh, to go where help is needed most. The firebombing aircraft have been in action against these fires. Uh, these are national assets and ensure the best possible aerial firefighting equipment is available, helping Australians. As well, the, RIF, the RAAF have transported firefighters and equipment to and from centres across the country. Disaster recovery assistance is being provided under the jointly funded Commonwealth State Disaster Recovery Funding Arrangements. In New South Wales, on-the-ground assistance is coming from the State Government. We are also providing extra financial assistance through the Australian Government Disaster Recovery Payment, which is a non-means-tested payment of $1,000 for eligible adults and $400 for children. There's also the Disaster Recovery Allowance, which is a short-term income support payment uh, to help those who've experienced the loss of income as a direct result of the bushfires. The Disaster Recovery Payment has been activated in 14 local government areas in New South Wales, and the Disaster Recovery Allowance has been activated in 32 areas in New South Wales. Both these payments are administered by the Department of Human Services. Uh, yesterday in New South Wales, uh, working uh, with the state government, we announced a $48.25 million bushfire recovery package for the North Coast, Mid-North Coast and Northern Tablelands. This package includes $15,000 worth of recovery grants for small businesses and primary producers and a $18.25 million community recovery fund to fund community projects that stimulate the economy, build resilience and provide needed mental health support as well. In Queensland, we're providing disaster recovery assistance under the DRFA in seven local government areas. Uh, this includes support for people suffering uh, personal hardship to help with their immediate emergency needs, as well as things like concessional interest rate loans and freight subsidies for primary producers. We've also activated the disaster recovery payment 
and the disaster recovery allowance uh, for people affected by the Queensland fires. And this support is uh, administered by the Queensland Government. We continue to work very closely with the Queensland Government. Uh, Mr. President, uh, I can report that every agency of the Commonwealth continues uh, to be ready to help uh, when and where they can. Across government, the necessary plans and responses have been activated. The ITO has activated the Community Disaster Rapid Response Group to support impacted taxpayers and communities. The taxpayers affected by the fires don't need to worry about their tax affairs. First things first, uh, get back on your feet. The Department of Health has been working with pharmacists regarding the supply of medicines to affected communities. The full resources of the Australian Defence Force have been available to assist when and where it has been requested. The Minister for Defence has directed and authorised all local base commanders to provide immediate assistance wherever it is required. Uh, Mr President, in a continent as big as ours, it's not a question of if a natural disaster hits but when, and that is particularly the case for fires. Since the aftermath of Black Saturday, uh, Commonwealth, state and territory governments have actively maintained a level of national preparedness that should uh, reassure all Australians. Our preparedness for natural disasters includes a $130.5 million investment by the Commonwealth over five years to reduce the risk and impact of disasters on Australians. As part of this work, $104 million is being distributed to states and territories under a new national partnership agreement on disaster risk reduction for investment in initiatives that reduce disaster risk at the state and local level. As well, we have developed closely with state, territory and local governments a national disaster preparedness framework to ensure we're positioned to effectively prepare for and manage severe, severe to catastrophic disasters. Now, this framework is about developing a new national disaster capability so that people have access to the best information and guidance needed to make risk-informed decisions. Our support of the National Aerial Firefighting Centre, an annual $15 million investment, is providing a highly specialised firefighting aircraft that is available to states and territories. In December last year, we added another $11 million on top of our annual investment. We have also invested in emergency alert, supporting the national telephone-based telephone warning system. As well, we are also investing over $6 million in the next generation Australian fire danger rating system to deliver, to deliver more accurate and local risk messaging. Our efforts are all about working in partnership with the states and territories, particularly the fire and emergency service professionals. As the providers of police and emergency services, the states and territories take the lead and we back them with our own capabilities. All work in such dynamic environments can be improved, but we are proud of the progress of our national efforts preparing for the worst wherever and whenever it may be. Mr. President's time like this reminds us uh, all uh, what truly matters. Uh, to the families of those who've lost their lives, for those who are injured, we send the thoughts of everyone in this place. We're in awe of our countrymen and women who have all stepped up, our firefighters and volunteers, our servicemen and women, uh, community members and neighbours, as well as the businesses who gave their staff leave uh, passes to go and fight the fires. Everyone has played their part. We have prepared accordingly. Uh, we know that more broadly uh, there are debates and discussions about fires during droughts and uh, times of climate change. This building is the place where these discussions, of course, uh, should ultimately take place, but uh, we do ask uh, that, this de that um, in these debates we have the same generosity that the Australian people have shown through their actions over recent weeks. Um, um, there are still difficult days ahead, but we can draw strength from the way all our people and our agencies are responding, Australians helping Australians. More than fires or floods, that's what defines our country, and we can all be proud of that. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr. President. I'll seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted. Uh, Labor joins with the government in extending our sincere sympathies to the hundreds of Australians who've lost loved ones homes, farms and livestock in recent weeks due to the terrible bushfires we've seen around most of the country. I think all of us have been touched by the scenes that we've witnessed uh, and we send our very best wishes to those who are recovering. Last week I visited a number of areas that were badly affected by bushfires in central Queensland and southwest of Brisbane and I've seen for myself uh, the long road to recover that many of our uh, fellow Australians face. We also join with the government in thanking emergency personnel, volunteers, community groups and community leaders who are doing a fabulous job uh, to assist in that recovery effort. 
Many have commented that these bushfires are unprecedented in nature, in their breadth, in their intensity and in their timing, starting earlier and going for longer than anything we've seen before. Indeed, the science is telling us that we are likely to see more extreme weather events, bushfires, floods and cyclones in future due to climate change. The government's own scientific advisers, CSIRO, the Bureau of Meteorology and emergency leaders are all telling us this. As leaders, we have a responsibility to listen to this advice and to act, and it's in that spirit that the Labor leader, Mr Albanese, has written to the Prime Minister seeking an urgent COAG meeting to discuss disaster preparedness. Whatever we think about climate change, and I recognise in this chamber there are very many different views about climate change, whatever we think about climate change, we owe it to Australians to prepare for a changing future. Labor believes this is a serious challenge facing our nation and that COAG is the appropriate forum to deal with it. We hope the government will take up our suggestion and bring federal, state and territory and local government leaders together to ensure that all Australians are fully protected from the risk that natural disasters pose into the future. Senator Di Natale. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, I rise on behalf of the Australian Greens to make a, a short I statement. Assume leave is granted. Leave is granted. Uh, just as we did in this chamber two weeks ago, we express our deep sadness and our grief at the lives, homes, and habitat lost from these <coughs> catastrophic bushfires. We again extend our deepest gratitude to the women and men who have been putting their lives on the line to contain these unprecedented fires from burning across multiple states. When you consider the level of containment of these fires in terms of damage to property and lives, it's, it's remarkable, given how extreme the fire and weather conditions have been. And uh, to put it simply, our volunteer and professional firefighters have behaved like heroes. And we thank them very deeply for their wonderful efforts. Uh, but thoughts are not enough. Thoughts are not enough. What our firefighters are telling us is that they're dreading the months ahead as we enter into what has traditionally been known as the bushfire season, but that's a season that no longer exists in the age of our climate crisis because our bushfire season now extends to an almost all-year-round threat. So let me be crystal clear, Mr President. Australian Greens will not stop talking about what is driving these fires. We will not be silenced because we know that these disasters are happening with more intensity and greater frequency, and that's putting people's lives at risk. Let me be even clearer. What is driving these fires is the burning of coal, oil and gas, and we now know that Australia's greenhouse pollution from coal, oil and gas is the highest it has ever been. What Australian climate scientists who are working on bushfires said back in 2006 has now come to pass. Governments have had an opportunity to act at every stage, and they have failed. So if we don't face up to this fact, we continue to put communities and indeed firefighters in harm's way. So again, well, of course, we express our thoughts towards people who have suffered from these fires. We also know that government's highest priority should be keeping its citizens safe, and that means no longer locking in behind the coal, oil and gas industry. What our communities desperately need now is a rapid transition to a renewable energy economy and to unlock the thousands of jobs that come with that investment. And that requires a plan. Again, we reach out to the government and the opposition. We reach out to them and say we are prepared to work on a plan across party lines about how we drive down pollution and about how we create those jobs that come with this planned transition and we ensure that no person is left behind. Since the last statements in the Senate on bushfires two weeks ago, we've seen more <coughs> casualties, taking the total to four. We've seen insurance claims from destroyed property increase from 150 to, two, to 500. We've seen catastrophic code red warnings called in South Australia and Victoria. And we know 
that conditions usually expected in January and February are recurring right now. Climate change is no longer something for future generations to be concerned about. It is happening right now, and we are experiencing the effects of the climate crisis. So again, let me say this. I know there are many politicians in this place. I know there are many people in the gallery, many journalists, who want us to be silent. We won't be silenced. We will continue to do everything within our power to keep the issue of the climate breakdown front and centre during these national disasters, because now is not the time for silence. Now is not the time for appeasement. Now is the time to fight for those communities, for our firefighters, for all of the animals that live in habitat that's been destroyed. We will continue every day to remind the Australian community of this government's culpability and responsibility for these tragic events. Senator Hanson. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted. Thank you very much. A sunburnt country by Dorothy McKellar. It really does explain what Australia is all about. From drought, flood and fires. We can expect it, and we have done for the since we were first um, the country we was first founded. To stand here and listen to um, Senator Di Natale and his comments blamed on pollution and coal and fire is far from the truth. The fact is that we do live in a very dry nation, and it is because of government's interference and in locking up our national parks, not burning off the waste and not protecting our lands is why we find ourselves in this predicament with an ever-increasing population of not supplying the water resources that we need to fight the fires. Our national parks have grown. No one can go in there. No one can clean them up. Even farmers are not allowed to actually allow animals in to graze on the lands. Debris is not allowed to be cleared or taken by Australians who may use it for some other purpose. It is a drastic and devastating to all of us because we all have electorates and people in our electorates that we are supposed to be representing and taking note of and caring about. These fires have been absolutely devastating in Queensland and up in the place in Yapoon. There's um, Causeway Lake, Adelaide Park, around 20 structures burned and countless families and bush um, businesses uh, were um, evacuated. It wasn't because of climate change, it was because of a 16-year-old boy that actually lit the fire. Well, we have another nine-year-old in New South Wales that lit the fire. <laughs> we have many people out there, even as young as nine, who want to cause havoc and trouble and do not care about the people around them that causes the fires, not because of pollution. I feel for these people that have lost their, their structures, their homes, their belongings, their, fam their pets and the deaths that have been caused because of these fires. I do congratulate and honour the men and women, the firefighters and those volunteers that have risked their own lives to save properties. But I, I have to say, and the Australian people, uh, just sometimes, and I'm, am I myself a gobsmacked? We're going through devastation on top of the drought and now with the bushfires. And to see that the New South Wales government has earmarked $48 million for the bushfire recovery and the community recovery packages is a joint federal and state government initiative and includes grants of up to $15,000 to help the recovery of small businesses and farmers. And I'm sure they are very appreciative of that. And 18 million of the 48 million package has been earmarked for community projects. Again, very good. But when you put it in comparison to what Australia has just announced, a $300 million loan for Papua New Guinea to help pay for economic reforms and government financing from a country that we know is corrupt, their members of parliament are corrupt. Well, what about it follows the $500 million given to the Pacific Islands earlier this year to deal with so-called climate change impacts? And if, if Dean Natalia is saying that it's because of climate change, why are we not putting as much money into this country if it is so-called climate change and yet we give away half a billion dollars to other countries? 
This is what the people of Australia are fed up with, and Australia is also paying $607 million in aid to Papua New Guinea in 2019-20. So the whole fact is that the Australian people, we need to look after our own first and foremost and make sure the Australian people are given the aid and the assistance that they need, whether it's in drought, floods, fire, our natural disasters here. Look after our own first. Just remind senators to refer to each other by their titles in the chamber, please, at the commencement of question time. So I will now call Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australian, Senator Colbeck. Minister, when 16,000 older Australians died in one year waiting to receive the home care package for which they had already been approved, can the minister explain why the Prime Minister today announced only 10,000 new home care places when more than 120,000 older Australians are currently waiting? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Thanks, Senator Wong, for the question. Uh, as Senator Wong has indicated, today the government announced a significant package totalling $537 million to uh, add additional capacity into the aged care system as, a, as an immediate, immediate response to the Royal Commission's interim report. Mr. President. Uh, in, that, uh, in that $537 million package, Mr. President, there was about $500 million uh, for an additional 10,000 packages. And the reason that the government's made the response that we have, Mr President, is because we've actually taken notice of the Royal Commission's interim report, which talks about the growth of demand for home care packages as additional capacity has been put into the system. It puts, talks about concerns about uh, significant growth of home care packages and creating a circumstance like the Labor Party created when they put the Pink Bats program into place, where there was so much capacity put into the market that it uh, brought in chonky players. It actually ended up, um, unfortunately, uh, leading to four things. deaths. Uh, and so the Royal Commission talks about— so the Royal Commission's Order. report, Mr President, talks about doing a number of things. It talks about putting additional capacity into the system, which we've done. But it also talks about changing the way that home care is delivered. And so we are, we are inclined to do that. Mr. President, the Royal Commission said that in, its, in the report that uh, it would be looking to provide some advice to the government on how the home care delivery system would be modified. And so we've said that we will take notice of that, Mr. President. So, Mr. President, uh, the Labor Party um, really uh, should have a read of the report because we've done that. We're responding to it. I have read it. I have repeated it. And, and we are responding to it. Order, in a Senator Colbeck. Time way. for the answer has expired. On my left, order, Senator Wong, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. The Royal Commission has said that Australia's aged care system is a shocking tale of neglect which diminishes Australia as a nation. Can the Minister explain why Mr Morrison today put back only half of the $1.2 billion his own budget papers confirm he has cut from aged care? Senator Colbeck. Mr. Mr President, thanks, Senator Wong, for the question. Uh, but her question actually I reject the premise of the question. The, the, um, Order. the, the funding for aged care is increasing by an average of $1 billion a year and has done every year. Uh, Mr Order. President, when, when um, the deputy opposition leader came out last week or two weeks ago suggesting that uh, we might have cut aged care, as Senator Wong is doing at the moment. Uh, the RMA, RMIT ABC fact check put out a zombie alert. Put out a zombie Order. alert, Mr. President. Um, in fact, in, in reference to former Senator uh, who, who, who talked about his old par whole party being zombies, Mr. President. And so, if, if the RMIT uh, and that RMIT fact check said uh, that the claim of the Labor Party was misleading. So, Mr. President, uh, we've continued to invest in aged Order. care. We've continued, continued to invest in aged care. When we came to government, funding for aged care was Order. somewhere Senator about $13 Colbeck, billion. Time for the it's now close to 21. A final supplementary question, Senator Wong. Don't give up on this one. Order on my left. See, Senator Order Mullen, on my I left. agree with you. Senator Wong. Mr. Thank you, Mr. President. What is the minister's advice 
to a 95-year-old woman with a terminal illness who is on a wait list for a level four package and has been told that package under this government will not be available for 22 months. Minister, can you advise the chamber what this Australian should do while she is waiting for her approved package? Senator Colbeck. Thanks, Mr. President. Thanks, Senator Long, for the question. What I'd say to uh, that uh, patient who's waiting, uh, as of today, that package is much closer because we've just put 10,000 additional, 10, additional packages into the system, Mr. President. Uh, and can I say, I find it very difficult to take any criticism, pro criticism from the Labor Party with respect to the funding of home care packages, because at the last election they went to the, to the campaign, they went to the Australian people, with a $387 billion bill for additional taxes. $387 billion in additional taxes, including taxing older people, uh, and they did not include one additional home care package, Mr. President. Not one additional home care package did the Labor order. Party Senator put in Colbeck, the policy I, I, the last election. I've got Senator Wong on a point of order. Senator Wong. Direct relevance in this. The question is what this minister who is responsible is saying to the Australian, the woman, the 95-year-old woman, about her 22-month wait. It is not directly relevant to the question to discuss what happened in the election which returned you for your seventh year in government. This is your responsibility. Now, I, I, I think it is fair to say the minister was straying a touch from the terms of direct relevance, but as you rose, I note that he was talking about home care packages, which I do consider to be directly relevant. Um, but I take the point Senator Wrong raises on direct relevance is valid with respect to the issue immediately preceding that. Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, my very first words were that the home care package for that person is much closer as of today's announcement. And clearly, the Labor Party is still very sensitive about the fact that they had $387 billion in new taxes and not a single home care Order, package. Order, Senator Colbeck. Time for the. Before I call you, Senator Brockman. I draw to the attention of honourable senators the presence in the chamber of members of a parliamentary delegation from ASEAN. On behalf of all senators, I wish you a warm welcome to Australia and in particular to the Senate and to Question Time. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Mr President. My question is also to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Can the minister please further update the Senate on the progress of the government's response to the Aged Care Royal Commission's interim report? Minister for, Senior Australia, for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. President. Improving the quality of the and safety of our aged care system is a top priority for the Morrison government. Today, I was pleased to stand with the Prime Minister to announce significant investments, which form part of our continuing reforms to the aged care system. Today, we announced that we will deliver a $537 million funding package as an immediate response to the interim report across the three identified priority areas that the Royal Commission called us to act on, including a $496.4 million package for an additional 10,000 home care packages to be rolled out from 1 December 2019, $25.5 million to improve medical management programs to reduce the use of medication as a chemical restraint on aged care residents at home and new restrictions and education for prescribers on the use of medication as a chemical restraint. Delivering a $10 million package for additional dementia training and support for aged care workers and providers, including to reduce the use of chemical restraint and investing $4.7 million to help meet new targets to remove younger people with disabilities from residential aged care. Mr President, the Royal Commission's interim report is very clear. As a country, the government, the aged care sector and the entire community, we can and must do better in providing improved support for our older Australians. These measures will complement the major reforms the, government, the Morrison government has been undertaking to improve standards, oversight, funding and transparency of the care of older Australians. We will unify the Home Care and Commonwealth Home Support programs in line with the Royal Commission's direction to deliver a seamless system of care, tailoring services to the needs of the individual. These changes will be guided by the final recommendations of the Commission and will give the goal of improving care and ending the Order, wait for home Senator care packages. Colbeck. Senator Brockman, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. 
Minister, how does today's announcement build on the government's recent investments to support aged care services in Australia? Senator Colbeck. Order. Let the minister commence before the disorderly interjection start, please. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, thank you, Mr. President. The Morris government continues to take strong and immediate action to respond to the three priorities identified in the Aged Care Royal Commission interim report. In relation to home care packages, since the 2018-19 budget, the government has now invested $2.7 billion in 44,000 new home care packages, and we have more than doubled the number of packages available since Labor left office. These additional 10,000 packages announced today will be focused on the Royal Commission's identified areas of need and is strongly weighted towards high level of levels of care. Our better medication management and dementia training commitment builds on the action we've taken to deliver new restraint regulations. These regulations put explicit obligations on residential aged care providers in respect of the use of restraints, and the Royal Commission identified an over-reliance on chemical restraint in aged care. There. Therefore, from 1 January 2020, we will also establish stronger Order, safeguards Senator and restrictions Senator for prescribing a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Minister. Minister, in addition to these investments, how is a strong economy supporting the government to deliver targeted programs to support senior Australians as they transition to aged care? Senator Colbeck. Order. Thank you, Mr. President. Our track record in improving health, uh, aged care since the Royal Commission was called is extensive. Beyond what I've already outlined, we have done the following. We've released 14,275 new residential care places. We've obviously established the new Independent Aged Care and Quality and Safety Commission. We've implemented new customer-focused aged care quality standards. We've put in place a new single charter of rights for senior Australians in residential care, covering 14 fundamental protections for all aged care programs from safe quality care to independence, information, personal privacy, control, fairness and choice. We've expanded the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Flexible Aged Care Program by approximately $50 million over four years. We've provided $4 million to increase aged care services to people mainly in rural and remote areas through the multi-purpose services program. We've provided an ongoing 30 per cent increase in the viability supplement and a 30 per cent increase Colbert, in the homeless time supplement. time for the answer has expired. Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, my question is to the minister representing the Minister for Industrial Relations, Senator Payne. Last week it was reported that an organisation had broken money laundering laws 23 million times. Was it a union or a bank? The Minister representing the Minister for Industrial Relations, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President. I'm sure that Senator Farrell is aware that uh, it is a financial institution. It's Westpac. Senator Farrell, a supplementary question. Thank you, uh, Mr President. I do have one. Uh, why does the Prime Minister say the leadership of a bank is up to the board after it has broken the law uh, 23 million times, potentially contributing to the spread of child sexual exploitation material, but the government wants the power to expel union leaders and even shut down entire unions for minor paperwork breaches? Why is uh, one rule for banking executives and another rule for working Australians? Senator Payne. Much, Mr. President. And uh, if I recall correctly, Mr. President, what the Prime Minister said is that uh, he was uh, absolutely appalled uh, in relation to these actions. Austrac has initiated civil penalty proceedings in the federal Order. court against Westpac. Austrac will allege systemic, serious non-compliance with the Anti-Money Laundering and Counter-Terrorism Financing Act 2006. As you would expect, Mr. President, this will be handled through the courts. Senator Farrell, a final supplementary question. Yes, sir. thank you, uh, Mr. President. I do have one. Uh, when the government uh, introduced the Ensuring Integrity Bill, uh, the minister uh, claimed it was to establish corporate equivalence with unions. <laughs> How can there be corporate equivalence if 23 million breaches of the law be a matter for the board if you're a bank, but three breaches of paperwork uh, can get you deregistered if you're a union? Senator Payne. Mr. Mr. President, I made Order. it quite clear. Order on across the chamber. 
Left and right. Order. Uh, Mr. President. Order. I'll, I'll call the minute. I'll ask the minister to resume her seat, and I'll call her when I can hear her. Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. As I said to Senator Farrell and to the chamber, Austrac has initiated civil, civil penalty proceedings in the federal court against Westpac. You would expect this matter to be dealt with through the court, as the provisions, frankly, of the Ensuring Integrity Bill will, uh, will implement, Order Mr. President, through the courts. Austrac will allege serious, systemic non-compliance with the anti-money laundering and counter seat, Senator Payne. Senator Payne's blessed with a very loud voice, and I'm struggling to hear her because of the noise from my left. I assume that's not a reference to me, Senator O'Neill. Um, I'll ask the minister to continue. Um, thank you very much, Mr. President. As uh, I indicated in my previous answer, this matter will be dealt with as it should be through the courts. The provisions of the Ensuring Integrity Bill, Mr. President, similarly reflect that process. Order, order on my left, Senator Askew. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Women, Senator Payne. Today is the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. Can the minister inform the Senate of the government's programs and work to address violence against women across Australia? The Minister for Women, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Askew very much for her question. Stopping violence against women and their families in Australia is a significant priority for this government. Rates of domestic, family and sexual violence remain unacceptably high. Violence against women is a gross violation of their human rights profoundly impacting victims, their communities and society as a whole. That is why, as a government, we have committed over $850 million to address domestic, family and sexual violence since 2013, including most recently $340 million committed in the 2019-20 budget to support the fourth action plan, the National Plan to Reduce Violence and Women Against and, and Their Children 2010-2022. Last week, the government began the next iteration of the Stop It At The Start campaign, encouraging adults to reflect on their attitudes, to talk to young people about these matters, about respectful relationships, about behaviours that contribute to violence. Lifeline Australia are continuing to deliver domestic violence alert workshops, which will train about 18,500 health, allied health, educational, childcare and community support frontline workers over the next three years to recognise, respond and refer appropriately when working with people experiencing domestic and family <coughs> violence. We have also held a number of open grant rounds to fund community-led prevention activities and a new sexual violence accredited training program. In the next week, we will open a grant round to provide $60 million to expand emergency housing to help more women and children experiencing domestic violence find a safe place to stay. Mr. President, the engagement between the Commonwealth and the states and the territories is a very important part of our initiatives as well. Senator Askew, a supplementary question. Thank you. Could the minister also update the Senate on the National Imp Implementation Plan of the Fourth Action Plan of the National Plan to Reduce Violence Against Women and Their Children? Thank you. Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Today, with Senator Rustin and with our colleagues in the states and territories, we have released the National Implementation Plan of the Fourth Action Plan, which clearly demonstrates how the government is working with states and territories to reduce violence against women. I want to acknowledge Minister Rustin and also the State and Territory Women's Safety Ministers with, uh, and the Council for, with whom we have been working and collaborating uh, on this over recent months. The Australian Government is responsible for 34 of the initiatives representing our $340 million investment. The National Implementation Plan itself provides details of over 160 initiatives delivered under the Act, Fourth Action Plan. It's the first time under the national plan that we've seen the Australian government's activities together with those of state and territory governments. The plan sets out details for each of the initiatives, including funding, key milestones, intended outcomes and how it is linked to the 20 actions and the five national priorities of the fourth action plan. Senator, I ask you a final supplementary question. Thank you. 
Could the minister update the Senate on projects in our region that the government is funding that focus on eliminating violence against women and girls? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President, and uh, I appreciate Senator Askew's question because end ending gender-based violence is a key pillar of Australia's foreign policy and overseas programs in the Indo-Pacific. For example, through the Nabilan program in Timor-Leste, we provided more than 32,000 services to survivors of violence, including legal assistance, medical examinations, counselling and crisis accommodation, as well as working with the national government on policies to prevent violence. Australia is also making a contribution to the Pacific Partnership to End Violence Against Women and Girls, which will focus on promoting change at a community level to, end, to prevent violence. The Pacific Partnership builds on Australia's long-term support to expand services, including support for women's crisis centres in Cook Islands, in Fiji, in Kiribati, in Papua New Guinea, in the Solomon Islands, the Marshall Islands, Vanuatu and Tonga. And I try, whenever I am able, Mr President, on my visits to meet with those women's crisis centres in those locations. Senator Di Natale. Uh, thanks very much, Mr President. Uh, my question is to the Leader of the Government, Senator Cormann. Uh, Minister, last week the Prime Minister tried to mislead the Australian people by claiming there's no direct link between Australia's record high emissions and our increasing fire risk. Minister, we're the third biggest exporter of emissions from coal, oil and gas in the world, and ABC's fact check recently showed Australia's contribution at 4.4 per cent of the world's pollution, almost three times the figure cited by the Prime Minister, despite the fact that we're only 0.3 per cent of the population, by the way. Minister, will the Prime Minister apologise for misleading the Australian community and admit that Australia's pollution, both here and overseas, has a direct impact on the climate crisis and the increasing risk of bushfires? The Leader of the Government, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, I reject the premise of the question. Senator Di Natale, a supplementary question. Well, there you go. That sounds like someone's running scared. Uh, the former, order, former Prime Minister. That we don't need editorial order. Stop the clock, please. Senator Di Natale, you knew the reaction you get. We do not need editorialising during questions. There's an opportunity for debate after question time. Senator Di Natale. Uh, former Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull dismissed the Prime Minister's assertions that Australia has no real impact on climate change because of our uh, emissions profile. And he said by that logic, an individual Australian shouldn't pay any tax because it makes no difference to the bottom line. Uh, Minister, Malcolm Turnbull is right, isn't he? And will Mr Morrison finally accept that we need to start pulling our weight when it comes to Order. the climate Senator crisis? Sally. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, uh, we are pulling our weight, uh, to uh, use uh, your a form of words. Uh, our government is committed to effective action on climate change, but we're pursuing effective action on climate change in a way that is economically responsible, which is precisely what the Australian people would expect us to do. And you know, as I'm on my feet, uh, let me reflect on the fact that we are approaching a 10-year anniversary of, uh, like, a temporary. It might have been temporary, but of a coalition between the uh, Liberal and National Parties and the Greens, uh, the Greens. Ten year anniversary of the Greens having joined with us to ensure uh, that Labor's uh, disastrous uh, carbon pollution reduction scheme, which would have harmed our economy while, of course, leaving the environment uh, worse off, uh, was defeated. So the Greens have a proud track record, of course, uh, in uh, defeating uh, government efforts along the lines that you now seem to be, you, you now seem to be advocating for. We don't have any lectures to take uh, from uh, the Australian Greens. You're just playing politics. Order, Senator Cormann. Time for the answer has expired. Order, Senator Di Natale, a final supplementary question. Now, um, Minister, Mr Turnbull also said that subsidising coal, and I quote, is as crazy as it gets. Given the link between coal and our climate crisis and bushfires, Minister, will you rule out any further subsidies for coal-fired power? Senator Cormann. Um, th th thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, Mr President, we, we live uh, in a great democracy, and uh, I, every, every individual Australian uh, is entitled to express 
uh, his or her view. Uh, in relation to uh, climate change, let me, let me make the point again. Our government is committed to effective action on climate change in a way that is economically responsible. Let me also make clear uh, that Australian coal will continue to play an important role when it comes uh, to uh, the supply of energy uh, here order. in Australia Senator and Coleman, indeed I've got Senator Natale on, on a point of order. Senator on a point Dinatale. of order. Relevance. Uh, question was very, very tight. Will you rule out any further subsidies to coal? Um, um, that was the second part of your question. It, it had, had a preamble, Senator Di Natale. I consider the minister's being directly relevant to part of the question asked. Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. There's no basis for. I mean, I reject the premise of the question, and let me again say, our government is committed to effective action on climate change in a way that is economically responsible. But let me also reassure uh, Senator Di Natale, in case he was. Uh, concern to be recognised on this side of the chamber that coal will continue to play an important role when it comes to the supply of reliable and affordable energy across Australia and indeed across other parts of the world. Senator Walsh. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Industrial Relations, Senator Payne. A report by PwC has found one in five employees in the construction healthcare, retail, accommodation and food service industries have been victims of wage theft. Why, after six years in power, has the government done nothing to address rampant wage theft? Order. Order on my right. Order. The minister on my right. The Minister representing the Minister for Industrial Relations, Senator Payne. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I thank the Senator for her question. Uh, let me be very clear that this government has zero tolerance for any exploitation of workers. That includes the underpayment of wages and entitlements by any employer. And in fact, we have taken significant action to date to protect vulnerable workers. We've included over $60 million in additional resources and more powers for the regulator, the Fair Work Ombudsman, as well as increasing penalties against law-breaking employers by up to tenfold. The increased funding means the Fair Work Ombudsman is better resourced to continue its very important work, recovering 64 per cent more money for workers in 2018-19 compared with those opposites last full year in office in 2012-13, and securing more than double the amount of court-ordered penalties against employers. We have also introduced higher penalties, as I said, Mr. President, without which are having an impact. The first decision taking into account our new Protecting Vulnerable Workers legislation was handed down by the court in late August. The penalties of over $125,000 against operators of two food outlets in Queensland were um, imposed. And the Fair Work Ombudsman's firmer stance is also starting to deliver results. The latest data confirms that we've seen double the amount of litigations filed. And as I said, a 60 per cent increase in the amount of money recovered for workers by the Fair Work Ombudsman this calendar year to date compared with the last, with almost 20 per cent more employees benefiting from Fair Work Ombudsman recovery action. So notwithstanding those changes, and we recognise that the majority of employers, the majority of employers try to do the right thing by their workers. But there are those that do not, Mr President. And there have been some who've been asleep at the wheel, who haven't paid enough attention to ensuring that they're meeting their obligations that they owe their employees, because it seems they pretend Order, to prefer Senator Payne. Senator Walsh, supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. The PwC report found that wage theft costs working Australians $1.35 billion every year. Can the minister confirm that this government is happy to allow companies who have committed wage theft to continue operating? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. And uh, I've been through a number of the uh, steps that the government has taken, including the Protecting Vulnerable Workers legislation, including the support for the Fair Work Ombudsman. But we are also in the process of drafting legislation to introduce criminal penalties for the first time for the, for, for the worst forms of worker exploitation. That is one of the key recommendations, for example, Mr. President, of the Migrant Workers Task Force. We have also released a discussion paper focused on identifying further 
improvements to protections of employees' wages and entitlements, which includes stronger civil penalties, greater deterrence for sham contracting, closely examining the suitability of employers' liability where entities in their supply network flout employment laws. We will release a further discussion paper seeking feedback on the compliance and enforcement framework in the coming weeks. Mr. President. That paper is canvassing topics which include faster, more efficient remedies for workers to recover unpaid wages and empowering the Fair Work Ombudsman to pursue order. banning and Senator disqualification Payne, order applications against directors. Of Senator Walsh, a su final supplementary question. Minister, why is it one rule for companies committing wage theft and another rule for unions who seek to protect working Australians against it? Order. On my right, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Just because those opposites say it doesn't make it true, Mr. President. And I have been very clear about the uh, initiatives and the legislation which we will uh, produce from the recommendations of the Migrant Workers Task Force, about the Protecting Vulnerable Workers initiatives, about the efforts of the Fair Work Ombudsman and the funding and uh, powers that we have provided in that context. So what that actually says, Mr. President, is we take this issue seriously, and we also take seriously the poor behaviour of some organisations Order. that those opposite would apparently seek to defend. Order. Before I come to you, Senator Hanson, I'd like to draw to the attention of honourable senators the presence in the gallery of a delegation from the Czech Republic, led by the Deputy Speaker of the Chamber of the Deputies of the Parliament of the Czech Republic, Mr Wojciech Pikal. On behalf of all senators, I wish you a warm welcome to Australia and in particular to the Senate and to Question Time. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much, Mr. President. My question is for the Minister for Agriculture, Senator Mackenzie. Minister, your own department was worried about a mandatory dairy code driving down farm gate milk prices. As a consequence, they recommend further analysis be done in the form of an impact analysis before drafting instructions were prepared for the mandatory code you issued in late October. Was this additional analysis done? And what did it say? The Minister for Agriculture, Senator Mackenzie. Thank you very much, Senator Hanson. Um, as you know, our government is uh, absolutely committed to taking strong action to support uh, our 5,200 Australian dairy farmers. On October the 28th, 2019, the Mandatory Dairy Code of Conduct Exposure Draft was released for its third round of consultations. These consultations ended uh, last Friday on the 22nd of uh, November, and right now depart my department is considering those consultations and will be making uh, appropriate adjustments to the exposure draft based on the feedback from our eight very, very distinct dairying regions around the country. As you know, uh, your home state of Queensland uh, has very unique challenges as opposed to those dairy farmers in Western Australia or indeed to those dairy farmers uh, suffering from high, excessively high uh, water prices in my own home state of Victoria. Each and every one of those uh, dairy industries feedback has been sought. Also, we've actually consulted with individual dairy farmers through our online mechanisms, uh, including a tele town hall uh, over the last two weeks. I've been personally speaking with dairy farmers from across the country to make sure that we get a mandatory code of conduct that actually delivers for our dairy farmers, that actually ensures that the unconscionable conduct that <laughs> dairy processors have been putting our dairy farmers under for way too long is actually regulated in a mandatory way. That is what the promise we took to the federal election. It is what we are delivering on. And make no mistake, we will not be bringing in a mandatory code of conduct that the dairy industry in Australia does not support. Senator Hanson, a supplementary question. Well, four and a half years later, trying to get this dairy um, code of conduct, and, and I can't believe it. Um, another 400 dairy farms gone. I'm sure last time I asked you a question, Order. it was. Um, Sen I did make the observation earlier, time. Senator Hanson. Questions so don't I, need to be editorialised. Minister, in view of the criticism by farmers of your department's exposure draft of the dairy code of conduct, why are you and your department? forcing tomorrow's attendees of a mandatory dairy code of conduct stakeholders forum, forum to sign a confidentiality agreement. Senator McKenzie. 
Uh, thank you, Senator Hanson. As the depart my department is undertaking to sift through uh, and analyse the submissions that they got on Friday, and they're working very, very hard to get this done because we want this code in place as soon as possible. We know that farmers right now, right across the country, are, are looking to sign contracts for up to five years, locking in relationships with processes that could be better regulated through a mandatory code of conduct. So we want to get this done as soon as possible. We want to make sure that those com conversations that are, we are having tomorrow with the department uh, and uh, dairy industry from right across the country are confidential, Senator Hanson, are actually confidential conversations so that they can be had in good faith and that what results in, in the, out of those conversations will actually be put into a final uh, draft of the code, which we will be taking to regulate as soon as possible and Order. give our farmers Senator a McKenzie. fair go. Senator Hanson, a final supplementary question. <laughs> Minister, I have personally been contacted by farmers and representatives from the dairy industry, one being the Queensland Dairy Farmers, who represent 78 per cent of the dairy farms in Queensland and the New South Wales Dairy Farmers as well, calling on me, um, supporting me for a farm gate floor milk price. If the mandatory dairy code does not lead to an improvement in farm gate prices, what will the government do? Given it will not support my proposal for a farm gate milk floor price, Order. or Senator in fact Hanson, any regulation. Time for the question has expired. Senator McKenzie. Thank you very much, Mr. President. You might have missed it, Senator Hanson, but on Thursday we were able to deliver on another election commitment from our government to the Australian dairy farmers, to Dairy Australia, to actually provide for legal and financial literacy support for our dairy farmers as they negotiate uh, contracts. We've got $10 million on the table to help them get their energy costs down. We've got a $22 million package we took to the election outside of the mandatory code of conduct to support our dairy farmers. Our dairy farmers are doing it tough right across the country and for a variety of reasons despite a historically high dairy price. It's because of the input costs, Senator Hanson. Their water's gone up 300 per cent. Their fodder prices have gone up 50 per cent. And in home states like your own, where a state government uh, games the system on electricity prices with a perishable product like dairy, that too is increasing the input costs and making it incredibly challenging. We stand with our dairy farmers and will continue to support them. Order. 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 Senator Macdonald. My question is to the Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, Senator Canavan. Can the Minister update the Senate on the Liberal National Government's record investments in infrastructure and how those investments will better connect our cities and regions and build a stronger economy? The Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator Canavan. Well, thank you, Mr. President. I thank Senator Macdonald for her question and uh, know how passionate she is about building better infrastructure in Order, Queensland, her state, home state in particular, but right across the country. And that is exactly, Mr. President, what the government is getting on with doing. We have a record uh, investment in infrastructure rolling out around our country right now, about $100 billion over the next 10 years. Never before has an Australian government funded more infrastructure at one point in time. There are over 130 or 130 major projects funded and under construction at the moment, and they are supporting 85,000 jobs around Australia, Mr. President. That's enough jobs to fill up the ANZ Stadium in Sydney, Mr. President. Enough jobs uh, to fill up a football stadium are being created by this government's infrastructure package. Now, in a short space of time in this question, I don't have time to go through all those 130 projects, of course, but I'll just quickly go around the country to give a flavour. Uh, for example, in Victoria, in Senator Henderson's area, we have $2 billion being invested in fast rail from Melbourne to Geelong. I know a project she's fought for for a long time. We have $4 billion going to an urban congestion fund helping to cut travel times in our major cities around the country. There are $4.5 billion being invested in the Roads of Strategic Importance program. That program is all about increasing productivity. Uh, in our mining, in our agriculture, tourism sectors, to create more jobs, not just through construction. So that's why we've got upgrades Senator like Watt. Town Creek to, Towns to Townsville, uh, which will help unlock that minerals Senator corridor Watt. there. The Mango Roads, the Mango Roads in the Northern Territory. And we're just going into mango season. You'll all know that we'll have better mangoes coming soon because there'll be less bruising of those mangoes on smoother roads just near Darwin, where they're growing. 
and Carrathan and Mount Tom Price will help open up whole new mining opportunities, particularly in the rare earths, uh, lithium, uh, mineral sands opportunities that exist there in Western Australia. There's a lot more that I'm not going to have time to get through, but it's great to have such good news for Australians and get them into a job. Senator Macdonald, a supplementary question. Can the minister outline the benefits of bringing forward funding for major projects across the nation? Senator Canavan. <laughs> Senator Watt. Senator Watt. It's on thin ice, I think. <laughs> we right? Yes, Senator Canavan. We're all good. Call okay, I didn't know I had the call. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, uh, Mr. President, uh, I can outline uh, some further announcements, exciting announcements in regards to infrastructure. Last week, the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Infrastructure, uh, Mr. Michael McCormack, announced that we would bring forward further investments as well from that record uh, investment we're already doing, and it brings some of those forward. About four billion, just under four billion dollars of investments will be brought forward right across the country. And what this will do, Mr. President, is bring those jobs forward, those 85,000 jobs, some of those jobs that will be brought forward. Uh, to help our economy and get people moving. It will be projects like the Newell Highway in New South Wales, $200 million of that being brought forward there, uh, particularly to help drought affected areas. That area of the country is one of the worst affected by droughts, and that project being brought forward will create jobs in an area of the country that is doing it really tough at the moment. Now, all of these projects will help support our economy, and then they'll build a better economy for the long term because it will be more productive, uh, cut travel times, and allow more jobs to be, to be built outside the infrastructure space as well. Senator Macdonald, the final supplementary question. How will these investments deliver stability and certainty in my home state of Queensland? Senator Canavan. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Well, Mr. President, there's a, there's a lot going on in Queensland under our record investment uh, pro, pro program, but in particular, 20 projects will have funding brought forward under the announcements last week. They include upgrades of the M1 south of Brisbane, the Bruce Highway, which runs all the way up to Cairns, Warrigo, which goes out, Warrigo and Cunningham Highways, which go out west, and the North Coast Rail Line as well. We've also, very excitingly, re finally, re re finally uh, we've had the Queensland Government agree on the inland rail investment package as well, and that unlocks $9 billion of funding right across the country to build our first proper rail line, inland rail line, I should say, from Melbourne to Brisbane. That project is going to create 7,000 jobs alone, another small football stadium of jobs being created just on that program. It's very, very exciting. And one of the programs being brought forward is in my part of the world, in Ms. Uh, Senator Macdonald's part of the world, in central Queensland, where we'll upgrade the Rocky Ring Road, which will help more than 70,000 vehicles a day cut travel times and go through fewer traffic lights. Very exciting for our Order. country. Senator O'Neill. Mr President, my question is to the minister representing the Minister for Government Services, Senator Rustin. In the face of two federal court actions and a national class action, the government last week announced that it was no longer pursuing robo-debt where the only information relied upon is the department's own averaging of ATO income data. Can the minister confirm the number of people affected by this backdown? The minister representing the Minister for Government Services, Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, and thank you very much, Senator O'Neill, for your question. Um, obviously, um, the government um, has a responsibility to continuously improve um, our, uh, the protection and integrity of our welfare system. And as part of that, order, order on my left, order, hmm. Senator Rustin. Um, in providing some context to the question that's just been asked by Senator O'Neill, I would uh, just like to, uh, to say that the federal government spends in excess of $110 billion a year on our welfare system. And obviously, it is absolutely essential. Order. Senator O'Neill on a point of order. On a matter of relevance, there are hundreds of thousands of Australians who are hanging on the minister's answer. They very much understand the context. I draw her attention to asking the number of Australians affected by the government's backdown with regard to robo debt so, last week. Um, on the point of order, if I may provide some advice to the chamber, I, the term direct relevance has narrowed the meaning that was previously allowed, where broad context was allowed in response to an answer. My interpretation of the term direct relevance adopted by the Senate is that that has been narrowed. However, Senator O'Neill, you did restate the last part of the question. I do consider it to be directly relevant for the minister to be talking about the first part of your question, which was the change in government policy as well. I do consider that to be directly relevant. That answer can be debated after question time, if appropriate. Senator Ruskin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. 
Um, in, in direct response to your question, Services SA, um, uh, sorry, Services SA, bring my home state, Services Australia, um, is currently in the process of identifying those people who may be impacted um, by this particular change in measure uh, for ensuring the integrity of our social welfare system. Um, I see there is no value whatsoever in preempting that process, um, but it is very important for people to understand that income averaging uh, does not occur in all debt determinations. Um, and past cases we where we identify um, the debts involved or part debts um, were solely the case of income averaging um, that we are in the process of identifying those people and giving them the opportunity to have a review of their particular cases. It is also very important to note that, uh, that, that generally the people that we're referring to here are people who have chosen, actively chosen, not to engage in the process of the Australian government seeking to recover debts that have, uh, have been uh, incurred by Australians. And I think Order. the average Australian would be very concerned to think that the Australian government was not taking its responsibility of debt um, get, uh, to reducing debt and making sure that people who have received payments of which they are not entitled, that Order. we continue Senator to recover Rustin, those time debts. Time for the answers expired. Senator O'Neill, a supplementary question. Thank the minister for her answer. The minister uh, responsible, Mr. Minister Robert, has insisted this fundamental revision would only affect, and I quote, a small cohort. Department of Human Services staff believe about 600,000 robo-debts have been raised using income averaging and will need to be reassessed. Does the minister agree that 600,000 robo-debts represents a small cohort? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much. Well, I don't know where you got the, uh, the number of 600,000 from, but obviously Order. the process under which uh, the, 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 the Services, S, uh, Services Australia will undertake the review to identify those people um, who may be eligible for a review of how uh, a debt has been determined um, will be a matter for them. And once we do that, we will be in a better position to understand how many people may well be impacted on this by this particular measure. But I would once again draw the attention to this chamber that right now, as of the 31st of October 2019, over 950,000 Australians uh, currently have 1.6 million debts with the government, and those social welfare debts total $5.3 billion. $5.3 billion of money that the Australian government currently has outstanding to people who have been identified Order. as not being Senator eligible Rustin. to Senator have Senator O'Neill, a final supplementary question. Minister, how many innocent Australians have had a debt raised against them that will now be withdrawn, and how many, how many have already repaid faulty debts? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, and thank you very much, Senator O'Neill. Um, can I just absolutely be clear here? If anybody receives a letter from Centrelink that alleges that there possibly could be uh, a discrepancy between the amount of money that they have notified the Australian Tax Office and Centrelink that they should contact Centrelink to determine whether that debt even exists. In the majority of cases when people actually contact Centrelink um, and there is no debt, it is very easy for that to be de determined. The problem we have here with the cohort of people that you're talking about is that they refuse to engage with Centrelink. They refuse to come forward so that the matter can be dealt with. So I think the Australian public has every reasonable expectation that people who may have a debt owed to the Commonwealth should come forward and have have that assessed or reviewed, which is something that this government is quite happy to do and has offered to do with anybody who believes they don't have a debt, we will Order, review Senator it. Order, Senator Rustin. Senator Mullen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr President. My, my question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Can the Minister update the Senate on the on Order. the benefits of defence engagement with the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN. Thank the you. Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. 
Well, I thank Senator uh, Molan for that question and uh, like the general acclamation in the chamber just then. I also welcome uh, you back and look forward to working with you again on defence and national security issues. Uh, in relation to the question, the Indo-Pacific region is clearly facing an increasingly complex and dynamic strategic environment. Uh, major power rivalries, North Korean nuclear activities, challenging, uh, challenges to international law in the South China Sea and asymmetric threats such as terrorism and cyber warfare all have the potential to undermine security in our region. And Southeast Asia is at the centre of these shifting dynamics, making regional forums uh, that make and facilitate dialogue between us all and cooperation more important than ever. Since its establishment in 1967, ASEAN has been, central has been a central pillar of regional peace, stability and also cooperation. Australia became ASEAN's first dialogue partner 45 years ago and has since maintained a very strong commitment to engagement with ASEAN and also participation in ASEAN-centred uh, institutions. Australia remains steadfastly committed to ASEAN centrality, which is why last week I was uh, delighted to represent Australia at the 6th uh, ASEAN Defence Ministers Meeting Plus in Bangkok in Thailand. And I congratulate the Kingdom of Thailand for conducting and delivering such an important uh, forum. Uh, the ADMM Plus is the premier forum for engagement between regional defence ministers. It seeks to foster practical military cooperation between the 10 ASEAN countries and eight plus countries – Australia, China, India, Japan, New Zealand, the Republic of Korea, Russia and also the United States. And in Bangkok, I had the opportunity to meet all uh, ASEAN defence ministers and I reiterated Australia's strong commitment to cooperation and to cooperate with ASEAN Plus to reinforce uh, pr promotion of openness, trust Order, and practical Senator cooperation. Renner. Senator Molan, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Minister, you mentioned the uh, Defence Minister's meeting in Bangkok. Can, can you update the uh, Senate, please, on the specific outcomes of the ASEAN? Senator uh, Reynolds. ASEAN Defence Minister's meeting. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, this year's ADMMM Plus meeting was productive and it also unanimously adopted the joint statement on advancing partnership for sustainable security. Australia's input helped to reinforce commitment to the peaceful resolution of disputes in accordance with international law and also for the respect of freedom of navigation and also overflight. The forum reviewed the progress of cooperation through the working groups on HADR, maritime security, military medicine, counter-terrorism, peacekeeping, humanitarian mine action and also cyber security. Australia announced it will co-chair the expert working group on military medicine with Brunei from next year. And I was also delighted to announce with the Philippine Secretary of Defence, Lorenzana, that Australia will transition its support under Operation Augury in the Philippines to an enhanced defence cooperation program from the end of this year. And this will enable the ADF to continue its highly Order, valued support Senator to countering regional terrorism. Senator Reynolds, time for the answer terrorism. has expired. Senator Molan, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, Minister, can you outline, please, to the Senate how the Australian government is strengthening its military relationships with key allies and partners to promote and enhance security in our region? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and yes, I can. Uh, as I've just said, Australia is facing challenges in our region that are increasing in number and also complexity. Australia cannot deal with these challenges in isolation, and strengthening defence relationships with regional par uh, partners is crucially important. In Southeast Asia alone, the ADF is busier than ever, conducting around 50 bilateral and multilateral exercises each and every year with some of our closest partners and friends, including Malaysia, the Philippines, Singapore, Thailand and also Vietnam. The ADF is also working with regional allies such as the United States and also Japan, including through the United States Force Posture Initiatives and also Exercise Talisman Sabre, to increase our interoperability and also to maximise our defence engagement in our region. This government will continue to work with our partners in support of the security and stability of our region. Senator Seward. President, Mr President, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Government Services, the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Minister, now that the government has finally agreed with recommendation three of the 2017 Senate inquiry into the robo-debt debacle, which 
dealt with suspending the use of the income averaging process, will the government now implement recommendation one of that inquiry, which is to put on hold the robo-debt scheme until all the procedural fairness aspects of this program are dealt with? The Minister representing the Minister for Government Services, Senator Rustin. Mm. Thank you very much, and thank you very much, Senator Seward, and I acknowledge her ongoing interest uh, in this particular matter. Um, as I mentioned in my response to um, Senator O'Neill when she asked me a, uh, a similar question in relation to uh, the re recent sort of uh, improvements that we are proposing to implement in ensuring uh, the fairness uh, with, the, with which we approach uh, making sure that the Australian um, social welfare system is sustainable. And as um, Senator Seward would be well aware, one of the very fundamental tenets of our social welfare system is its ability to be sustainable. Um, you know, we have one of the most uh, broad-ranging and comprehensive social welfare systems in, uh, in the world, and part of ensuring that the over $110 billion that is spent uh, annually on social welfare is to ensure that people only receive that of which they are entitled, no more order. and Senator no less. Rustin. Senator Seward, on a point of order. I was pretty tight with my preamble and asked a very specific question. Will, they gov will the government now implement recommendation one of the 2017 Senate inquiry, which was to put this process on hold? Um, now, I, I, you've restated what was a tightly worded question. At, at this point, Senator Seward, I actually believe Senator Rustin was being relevant if not being a point that you disagree with, but the government is the minister is allowed to provide reasons for an answer. Um, so I'll call the minister to continue, but I am listening very carefully. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much. Um, as I said, you know the recovering overpayments is absolutely fundamental to our welfare system, um, and what we have continued to do through the process of listening uh, to. Uh, the responses that we've received through Senate inquiries, through which Senator Seward refers, listening to the general public, uh, making sure that we constantly refine what we are doing to ensure that we have a balance between ensuring that we recover debts that are owed, money that is owed to the taxpayers of Australia, and also making sure that the system of collection is, is fair, is equitable, but is equally robust, is something that I believe that the Australian public expect of their government. So um, the processing of debts has been a feature of our system. And I'll take the interjection from Senator O'Neill. And I'd just like to quote to Senator O'Neill, I quote, we want to make sure that people aren't receiving welfare to which they are not entitled, and no one gets a leave pass on that. I wonder who said that. I think it may have been your previous opposition leader, Mr Shorten. Order. Senator, Senator Seward, a supplementary question. Does the minister think it's fair that thousands of people over the last two and a half years that robo-debt has been operating since the Senate inquiry, that thousands of people have now been traumatised, demonised, receiving debts under this process? Is that fair? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. What is fair, uh, Mr President, to Senator Sewell? What, what is fair is that people receive uh, the kind of support that they need, of which they are entitled to. And the fairness of our system is on the basis that people do receive that of which they are entitled. And I would say that if people are receiving debt notices or receiving communications from, the, from Centrelink or from the department that allege there is a possibility that a debt is owed, then I would suggest to them that they need to engage with the department to establish whether that debt actually exists, because in many cases a simple a piece of information can actually reveal that that debt doesn't occur. As I said, generally the people Order. that we are talking about here are people who refuse to engage with the system. Now, what other possible explanation can you have? People need to contact the department, put forward their case, and as I said, in the majority of cases, if there is no debt, it's easily identified Order, and Senator the debt Rustin, no longer time exists. Order, for the answer has expired. Senator Seward, a final supplementary question. Will the government apologise to and compensate those that have had false debt notices because the process used income averaging? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much. Senator Seward would be well aware um, that 
up to date anybody who can identify that a debt is not owed um, that, that that debt is waived. We provide people with Order. every opportunity in which to come forward and provide additional information to determine whether a debt, uh, an, a notice of, uh, of, of matching exists or it doesn't exist. So um, to come in here and suggest that, that every single person who has received a letter seeking additional information in relation to whether a debt is owed or not. Order, Senator Seward, on a point of order. I asked a question about those that had received a debt notice in error, and I asked, would the government apologise and compensate I think, them? I think, with respect, Senator Seward, a, a broadly worded question like that, the minister is entitled to some discretion in answering, and I think the minister is being directly relevant. Uh, well, I, I think the minister is being directly relevant. Senator, Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, Mr. President. And as I have been trying to explain to this chamber and to Senator Seward, if somebody believes that they have received a letter suggesting that they have a debt which they do not have, they should contact Centrelink so that they can be established. Because if it is established by additional information that the debt does not exist, then the debt is removed. So I think, Senator Seward, there is a very adequate system Order, in place Senator to deal Rustin, with the issue you're talking Senator about. Kitching. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Government Services, Senator Rustin. In 2017, the Senate Community Affairs References Committee found that robo debt was so flawed that it was set up to fail and recommended it be suspended immediately. That was in 2017. Then Social Services Minister Christian Porter refused to apologise for the trauma, stress and shame inflicted by robo-debt on Australia's most vulnerable. Now the scheme is suspended, will the current minister apologise for the trauma, stress and shame inflicted by the government's deeply flawed an unfair scheme. Minister representing the Minister for Government Services, Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, and thank you, Senator Kitching, for another question on the same subject. Um, recovering overpayments, as I've said, is an absolutely fundamental part of our welfare system. When somebody has a debt, the government is legally obliged to pursue that debt. As I said, if it's identified that that debt doesn't exist because they've provided additional information or they've engaged with the department, then of course there is an appropriate process through which um, that debt doesn't actually exist. We simply ask people, if they receive a letter asking for additional information, that they engage with the Department of, of uh, Human Services so that we can establish whether the debt does exist or not. If the debt does not exist, then of course there is never a debt that's being raised. But before the election, the government and the opposition used to be on a unity ticket with Labor over this. As I said, it was actually your uh, previous opposition leader who came out and said that, that this was a legitimate part of welfare and actually said no one gets a leave pass. Why is it all of a sudden order. now? Senator Rustin. Senator Kitching on a point of order. Point of order is on direct relevance, Mr. President. I asked if the minister would apologise for the trauma, stress, and shame inflicted by the government's deeply flawed and unfair um, scheme, especially given only 1,000 people have only ever been aided order, Senator by Kitching, Centrelink you're now stretching with their paperwork. A bit further beyond the point of direct relevance, um, the, the question contained a number of terms that I think, with respect, a minister is allowed to not specifically answer the question you would prefer, which is, will the minister apologise, but is entitled to be directly relevant to the other terms used in the question. I think the minister is, in this case, being directly relevant to the other parts of the question. Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much. And look, I, I refer, refer to a press release um, that was released by the Minister for Human Services um, on the 29th of June 2011. Uh, yeah, and I, I can quote from that. You know, beginning this year, Centrelink and the ATO would automatically match data on a daily basis as a way of cross-checking former welfare recipients who have a debt with the Commonwealth, those identified as having debts and who haven't made repayment arrangements. I underline my last point. Those who haven't made repayment arrangements. If you make a repayment arrangement or you engage with Centrelink, there, there is often that the, the, any debts are not raised. Um, 
The, and Order. the other thing I note, Ms Plibersek uh, also made the comment that the government prefers to work with people and provide them with flexible debt repayment options rather than having to garnish their tax returns. But Order. If people... Senator Rustin, time for the answers expired. Senator Kitching, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. The government's faulty robo-debt program was projected to meet a $2.1 billion budget savings target. With 600,000 potentially false debts no longer at the government's disposal, when will the government announce its revised budget position? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much. And as I said to the answer to a previous question on the very same thing, is that I actually um, you know, do not support accept the premise on which your question. Order, Senator, K Senator Kitching, on a point of order. Direct relevance. My first question was in relation order, to whether the minister. Whether the I, minister I... would apologise. The second question is about the budget projection of the department. It's relying on $2.1 billion Senator to make Kitching, a budget. Senator Kitching, please do time. not use the direct relevant point of order to make an argument. In this case, the minister was speaking for six seconds. The minister is allowed to challenge or to reject a presumption outlined in the question. And I hadn't heard the minister finish that sentence, so I cannot rule on a point of direct relevance at this point at all. Senator Rustin, please continue. Um, thank you very much, Mr President. And as I said, I reject the premise of the question because you're quoting a figure of 600,000, of which I have seen no evidence whatsoever um, is actually an accurate figure. Um, however, the thing that I find quite extraordinary is up until you lost the election on the 18th of May this year. We were on a unity ticket about the importance of being able to collect debts to make sure order. that our welfare system Senator, is sustainable. Senator Wong on a point of order. Order, please. Senator Wong is on her feet. Senator Wong. So I appreciate that, Mr. President. Thank you. Um, there is a, a, the point of order is direct relevance. Uh, the question goes to a budget savings target. $2.1 billion. And the question is whether there is a revision to that. I, I fail to see with respect to that. I know she's been given press releases and asked to use them in defence by her staff or someone else. But the reality is talking about unity tickets is not directly relevant, not directly relevant to a question about the revision of budget figures. Senator Cormann on the point of order. On the, on the point of order, uh, Senator Wong did not actually uh, com completely relate the question that was asked. There was a particular aspect to that question, which meant that the minister was quite right uh, to say that she did not um, accept the premise of the question. And that goes to, I mean, the assumption in the question was that just because a particular methodology was used that no debt was actually incurred. And that is wrong. That is wrong. And in any event, uh, Senator Kitchen should know that any updates are always provided at the relevant budget update. On the, on the, on the I, to be fair, Senator, I'll take the interjection. I have allowed some discretion with um, points of order on my left. Um, now, on the point of order, the question my notes reflect went to a projected saving, a claim about a number of debts, and then seeking a position from an announcement about a position from the government. Now, to be directly relevant to that question, I do not consider the position of the opposition to be directly relevant, uh, because that was quite a specific question. So I call the minister to continue. Just to absolutely clarify that position, I said that I rejected the premise of the 600,000 people that which Senator Kitching was basing her question. But as I said. Um, you know, it, it seems really interesting that you know, at one stage um, we have the opposition saying no one gets a leave pass, and now post the election, when they've been unsuccessful in victory, we somehow seem to have a co completely different thing. Everybody gets a leave pass. Everybody gets a leave pass. It's like all debts are waived. We don't have to Order. pursue the sustainability of our welfare system. I, 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 look, I'm going to do something I have not done yet, but which my colleague in the other place has done. I would ask ministers to listen to my, listen to my rulings because I just made a point that I didn't think the position of the opposition was directly relevant to the terms of that question. Senator Kitching, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. In the other place, uh, when asked about the belated decision to, to suspend robo debt, the minister, Stuart Robert, began his response by declaring, "The government does not apologise." Is this the government's? position and is the minister correct? Senator Rustin. 
Uh, look, thank you very much. Um, and I have been so intently listening to the proceedings of this question time, I have got absolutely no idea what was said in the other place during question time, and I have no intention of trying to channel Order. no intention of channeling the Minister for uh, Services. Senator Cormann. I ask that further questions be placed in an order speak. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Gallagher. Madam Deputy President, I rise to take note of the answers given by, or the answer given by Senator Rushton to the question asked by Senator Kitchen. And Madam Deputy President, I just want to say at the outset that uh, Senator Rushton said we were on a unity ticket with this government in this space. Well, that's not entirely correct. I suppose she is correct in that no working Australian, no taxpayer wants anybody to be availing themselves of the welfare system incorrectly or inappropriately. But what's happened in this space is really instructive. And there have been two Senate inquiries that have made recommendations in this space, one that Senator Seward alluded to and one that Senator Kitchen alluded to. But I'm going to just put on the record what the Commonwealth <coughs> Ombudsman said. The Commonwealth Ombudsman said <coughs> in the first iteration of the income compliance program, deliberate emphasis was placed on customers providing information, not the department, seeking information from employers. So the system changed. The system was quite simple that if there was a, an aberration in the, in the figures, people would be asked to provide information. Had they not provided the information, their employer would be asked to provide the information and that information would come back to the department. They would look at the two sets of information, decide whether there was a, a debt to be raised or not and if there was, they would action it. Well, what's happened clearly is that a new system has come into place, and that new system uh, started with an interim rollout of a uh, new compliance approach from the 1st of July 2015. DHS identified 100,000 discrepancy cases for manual assessment. However, this process differed by the previous process in several ways. The, uh, first, it placed greater emphasis on the obligation of customers to provide DHS with current and accurate information about their circumstances, including changes to earnings, and DHS <coughs> staff would no longer seek this information from employers for the purpose of calculating a debt. So it put all the emphasis on the customer. So, I mean, I'm sure that there are people on, uh, on New Start or welfare payments who keep impeccable records. But I'm sure, also very sure that there are people on those uh, unfortunate uh, circumstances gaining a new start payment or a welfare payment who've got no records, got no idea. And when confronted with a formal notice from a government department, who go into panic mode. They have no idea what to do. And in a lot of cases, they do nothing at all. So the debt is then automatically generated. This system has been challenged by Two Senate committees and the Commonwealth Ombudsman has made relevant, pertinent observations, and placing the onus on people right down the the, uh, uh, the system, recipients of welfare payments, to prove they don't have a debt, appears to be, um, you know, could well be, not the legal way that this country should operate. And it may be that, you know, there are uh, legal moves outside the Parliament clearly which have changed the minister's mind. And you know, they'll make no apology for it. It was driven off uh, a desire to build their surplus from wherever they could. Um, they just did a robo-debt calculation, sent it out. Now, the intriguing thing for me, if this robo-debt system is so good, why don't they use it to collect superannuation from recalcitrant employers? Why don't they use it to prevent wage theft? You know, because if you know the taxation department's getting its uh, its 32 cents or its 18 cents or its 47 cents, I don't know how much wages should be paid or how much are paid. Why is this robo debt collection model 
designed to focus on the least able to pay and the most vulnerable people in our community? And the answer is it's what they do. That's what makes that lot over there different from this lot over here. We don't set out to have a punitive regime going down to the most vulnerable in the community, ticking over debt, sending them a notice, knowing full well they'd have no records. There wouldn't be too many people who'd been on New Start or a welfare payment who would keep seven years of payroll records just on the off chance that Centrelink's going to ask them for a bit of, you know, a bit of evidence about how much they got. They rely on the system working. The ATO feeds information to DHS. DHS saw an opportunity to up their uh, revenue collection by what was it, two point something billion, and they are extremely harsh against people who are vulnerable. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Now your time has expired, Senator Abetz. Yeah, thank you, Deputy President. Let's be very clear: welfare payments are not payments by the government. These are payments by Australians from their taxes to their fellow Australians who are on tough times. It is, if you like, a uh, expression of those taxpaying Australians to those who are in hard times that they are willing to assist and provide them support in their time of need. Now, with a tax system, we do have situations where people seek to minimise their tax and take advantage, and therefore we quite rightly pursue those that don't pay enough tax. Similarly, in the welfare system, regrettably, there are those people that seek to manipulate the system and gain monies to which they are not entitled to. There are others that simply make honest mistakes, as occurs with a tax system. And so what we have on both hands is an Australian taxation office that genuinely seeks to recoup taxes that should have been paid and, on the other, welfare agencies that seek to recoup monies that should not have been paid. That is the motivation behind the so-called robo-debts. Once that is understood, the sort of ugly motives that the Labor Party seeks to impute in relation to this is completely unacceptable, without foundation, without fact, and it's just an attempt to besmirch the government, besmirch the agencies. Why? Because they don't have a positive agenda of their own to submit to the Australian people. It makes good sense that we, as a government, as the stewards of Australian taxpayers' money, seek to ensure that welfare recipients get that which they deserve and no more. Similarly, as good stewards, we seek to ensure that people pay the tax that they are required to pay and not less. And this is the balancing act of any good government that seeks to manage the economy for the well-being and welfare of all Australians. And so for the Australian Labor Party to come into this debate as they have shows again how devoid they are of understanding the way that our system works and seeks to support our fellow Australians. Now look, has the robo-debt uh, robo system had its faults? Yes. And I've been on the public record in my home state of Tasmania indicating some of those faults quite some time ago and assisting people who fell foul of it. It would be fair to say it was suboptimal. It could have been done better. But to try to impute the sort of motives that the Australian Labor Party have does them no credit and besmirches all those people that put the system together with some faults, and as those faults have come to light, the government quite rightly has reacted and responded to ensure that this system is as fine-tuned as possible, is as good as possible, to ensure that it is fair to all concerned. And within this debate, you never hear the Australian Labor Party reminding our fellow Australians that every single dollar of welfare payments doesn't just materialise out of the sky, it is actually taken by the Australian government out of the pockets of our fellow Australians. That is where the money comes from. 
and therefore it is right and proper as a government that we seek to ensure that only those that are entitled receive welfare payments and that those that accidentally or deliberately are paid too much make the repayment not to the government but to their fellow Australians because it is actually their money, not the government money. And we then heard from Senator Gallagher about wage theft, and there was a question by one Labor senator about closing down the companies that engage in wage theft. Wouldn't that be a good idea for the ABC that underpaid over 2,000 of their workers accidentally? The reason I raise this is people sometimes do make mistakes honest mistakes, and you have to take that into account, but then ensure that the repayments are made. That is what this is all about, and I support the Thank government's you, Senator moves. Senator time has expired. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much. And, uh, I want to just put on the record in response to uh, Senator Abetz's uh, tonally very reasonable uh, argument for the government that he, he mis mischaracterises what happens when we get funding and support for times when we might be unemployed and need some support? People who have paid tax all their life, like Deborah, who gave evidence to the committee in Tasmania around uh, very significant issues with the New Start program. She's worked for 35 years. She's paid her taxes for 35 years. The company went bust. She and many others lost their jobs and now after expending all of her life savings, she's on New Start. But she said that this government is making her feel that she is a burden on this country. A woman who's worked and paid taxes for 35 years being made feel by the, this government that she is a burden on society. A young man, Patrick, sitting next to her, saying he feels that the Prime Minister has made him feel so unworthy that the only thing that's preventing him from taking desperate action is that he wants to continue for his eight-year-old son. That's the state that we've got to in Australia because of this government and the kind of rhetoric that's embedded in this conversation. What is robo-debt? Well, hopefully you don't know what it is, but the people who know what it is, they, they know in a pretty bad way what it is. And it is exactly what Senator Gallagher said. About three years ago, this government figured out that they could ramp up a whole lot more uh, income into the coffers of the government if they started sending out notices to people based on information straight out of the ATO. Now, Australians who do have a period on Newstar have to fill in forms down to the level of each hour to account for money that they've had. They said put in very specific documentation about how much they've worked and how much they're eligible for. What this government decided to do was change the way things had been done, where reasonable claims like that could be judged against the evidence and information at the ATO, and then a government employee, a public servant, would do due diligence, go and have a look at the ATO information, have a careful look at the information that was held at Centrelink, make an inquiry of an employer make an inquiry of a bank, have a look at the whole thing and say, no, this person has done a pretty good job of keeping things square. They deserve every cent they've got to keep their family clothed, fed and sheltered, and that's an appropriate spend. What these guys did was, oh, well, we can get rid of that bit of the, the process. We can take the public server down and what we'll do is we'll make it robotic. That's where the robo comes from in robo-debt. So if the ATO, which averages out everything, decides that doesn't fit with your very specific week-by-week -week figures, which can amount to two very different numbers, as soon as the ATO doesn't match, out go the letters. So for the last three years, there have been three schemes that have been sending letters out to Australians without any of those checks and balances. It is, it is a disgrace. It disgusts me that in answers to questions that we asked at estimates in, in a room just up here in another part of the building, 
the department, when I asked how many people have you helped get the records that they need to prove that they don't have this debt, because that's what happens now. You've got to prove the debt. You're a 24-year-old. Get your figures, get your paperwork from seven years ago and prove to me, prove to the Australian government that you don't owe the debt. How many you think of 600,000 in the last uh, since the middle of 2016? 600,000 people have got the robo debt notices in that period. 900, the whole 100,000 for the whole scheme. How many people do you think that the government have helped, the the, the um, public servants have helped to get those documents? 1,000. 1,000 Australians out of 900,000 Australians have got a little bit of help from this government to get their paperwork together to prove that they didn't have a debt. And that's why we are outraged at this third iteration of this failed system in three years, and the government needs to be held to account for the shame that they have inflicted on people and the terror that they've put into people's livelihoods and trying to manage their finances. They are Thank just you, Senator wrong and failed. Thank you, Senator O'Neill. Your time has expired. Senator Van. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the question uh, raised in question time. Uh, as I said in my maiden speech, uh, earlier this year. We are the party of good government. Of that there can be no doubt. Good government means good governance. Good governance. I know it's a, a rare thing for those on the other side, so please continue to have a laugh. Please continue to have a laugh, Senator O'Neill. Just drink your water, please, Senator O'Neill. It will be better Order. for you. Order. Good government means good governance. And that means good stewardship of public monies, something those on the other side know little about. Money. Yes, taxpayers' money. And taxpayers foot the bill for $111 billion in social security payments. Is this a debating time, Madam Deputy President, or is it a, am I allowed to have um, the, the call order. myself? Just a moment. Senator Van. Senator Van has the right to be heard in silence. I would ask people to respect that right. Please continue, Senator Van. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. <laughs> As I was saying, good stewardship of public monies is the hallmark of good government. And as was just raised, Australian taxpayers foot the bill for around $111 billion in social security payments each year year. And the citizens of Australia, those taxpayers who contribute all that money, deserve nothing less than to be, have that money looked after the best that this government can. And I remind those senators here and those listening that the social security component of the budget is the largest by an enormous amount. We spend more on that than anything else. Now, just to correct something that was said opposite, welfare, welfare beneficiaries are not a burden to Australia. They are not a burden to Australia. When Australians need it, Australians deserve a hand up, as been, has been said many times by our Prime Minister. And that's what Social Security is for. It remains there for Australians who need it to get a hand up, to help them in times of need to help them through those difficult periods that anyone and any Australian can have at some point in their life. We need to reflect on that and why it's there, why we collect so much in taxpayers' funds, to be there as a safety net. And that safety net is there to drive people, to help them back onto their feet, to help them back into work or to get the uh, rest and recuperation they need. It's there to help people. It's not a handout. It's not a wage replacement. So when there are times, and, uh, and there are, when there is a miscalculation, then that, that the uh, government has a responsibility to collect back any of those overpayments. Compliance activity will continue for past and future welfare payment recipients, where there is a reasonable belief, and I reiterate, a reasonable belief that they have been overpaid. Now, refinements have been made a number of times to this program, 
and the government has an ongoing commitment to refine the income compliance program. We remain responsive to community feedback and have listened to the concerns around the current system. That much has been made in this clear in question time many, many times. We will continue to use income averaging as part of the range of options to ask a welfare recipient to engage with DHS if there is a discrepancy. And that's all we're asking them to do here, is to engage with the department if there is a discrepancy. Um, this is central to having community trust in the administration of the safety net. And I think you'll, re you'll all agree that good government means that the government must con maintain concerted focus on returning overpayments to taxpayers. We balance this with fairness and transparency in our compliance activities. People can ask the, government to, the department to review decisions or to provide new information at any stage of the process, which the government ombudsman reflects a as a reassessment, reassessment process functioning as it should. Thank you, Senator Fan. Senator McCarthy. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. This government's robo-debt scheme has been an absolute disaster. For years they've been pretending there is nothing wrong with a scheme that has proven to be inaccurate, unfair and incredibly damaging to some of our most vulnerable citizens. The robo-debt scheme is a perfect example of this government's heartless approach to governing. Known as online compliance intervention, the automated debt recovery system was anticipated to recover up to $4.5 million in welfare debt every single day. So it sounds good, hey, when you put it that way, if what you're looking at is the budget bottom line. The trouble is, of course, that we're talking about a system that impacts our most vulnerable citizens. A computer-generated system that delivers automated debt letters to welfare recipients without being checked first by an officer. The human toll of this robo-debt scheme has been enormous. It's a mess. So many terrible stories of mental and emotional toll the robo-debt scheme is having on Australians. And it has only been after immense and sustained pressure from Labor that the minister has hit the emergency brakes on this scheme. Too little, too late, and with major questions still remaining. And what happens to all those people who have already been victims of robo-debt? And what happens to all that money improperly obtained by the government? What happens to that? The Department of Human Services is reported to believe about 600,000 robo-debts have been raised using income averaging and will need to be reassessed. The Northern Territory provides a case in point of the shortcomings of this heartless approach to recovering debt from the most vulnerable. In the Northern Territory, as of December 2018, there were 15,196 residents receiving new start payments. 2,255 receiving youth allowance and 9,557 on the age pension. The NT's population of 254,854 is geographically dispersed and has very low population density. Over 50,000 people in the Northern Territory live in remote areas outside of the main urban centres of Darwin, Alice Springs, Tennant Creek, Catherine and Nullumboy. and It includes over 600 homelands and 96 Aboriginal communities right across. Aboriginal Territorians make up 30.3 per cent of the population and 49 per cent of Aboriginal Territorians live in rural or remote areas. So the nature of our population in the Territory impacts Centrelink's compliance program as well as the delivery of the uh, agency services. Remoteness gives rise to challenges regarding access to services, access to internet, telecommunications and online banking, and access to translators or services and resources in language. The reality of robo-debt means that if recipients are cut from payments, 
Connecting back to the correct income support is not straightforward. Delays in accessing payments mean that women and children go without material basics. This means food, kids going hungry. This means housing as people are unable to pay their rent. The government's own data shows that thousands of debts have been generated in error, with approximately one in five debts having been incorrect or waived. So how many of these incorrect debts apply to vulnerable people in the Northern Territory? How many debts have simply been paid because people have been unable to provide all the supporting documentation and evidence that's required retrospectively by Centrelink? The submission from Financial Counselling Australia to the Senate inquiry into Centrelink's compliance program highlights the fact that the government's failure to take extra care with vulnerability makes the debt collection process unsafe and unfair. The FCA recommends that all debt collection processes must be fair and must meet best practice standards. Binding standards are needed to ensure that Centrelink complies with best practice at all times. There must be a reasonable basis for collecting the debt. And it's astounding to consider that this hasn't necessarily been the case. Thank you, Senator McCarthy. Your time has expired. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Gallagher to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Seaworth. Thank you. I take note of the answer by Senator Rustin of my question um, about uh, robo debt and whether the government would now implement recommendation one of the 2017 Senate inquiry into the robo-debt debacle, which basically said robo-debt should be put on hold until the procedural uh, unfairness issues have been addressed. Now, you would have thought that listening to both the answers from Senator Rustin but also some of the uh, points made during Take Note, um, that there was nothing to look at here. Don't you worry about that. It was all Labor's fault. They were doing something a while ago. Oh, but don't forget there's a whole lot of money spent on their, what they say is a welfare. I just remind the chamber that when the government talks about all of that money spent on welfare, we are talking about access uh, assistance to the aged, in other words, the age pension. We're talking about veterans and their dependents. We're talking about people with disabilities and the NDIS. We're talking about family tax benefit. They imply that there's a whole lot of people cheating out there and we're spending a lot of money, but we are rightfully spending money on the people in our community that need that. But the government would have you think that there's no problem with robo debt. We've only just made a slight change. Well, they've actually fundamentally agreed now with recommendation th three of the Senate inquiry, which specifically dealt with income averaging. And recommendation three said, the committee recommends that all people who have had a debt amount determined through the use of income averaging should have their debt amounts reassessed immediately. Well, it's two and a half years later, two and a half years of more and more thousands thousands of Australians who have had debts generated by income averaging because that and reversing the onus of proof is at the heart of robo-debt. This system is fundamentally flawed. And the government, would the government have told us, I wonder, would, Sen would Minister Robert have come out and done that short media conference last week if there had not been leaked email saying to the, that the process had changed. Perhaps not. Perhaps we would not have found that out for some time. Fortunately, we did. But the government has a lot of unanswered questions. They say there's only a few affected. Well, that's nonsense. We know that income averaging is at the heart of the robo-debt fiasco. Instead of trying to change the name that we were using, i.e. robo-debt, Perhaps the government should have focused on making sure this system was fair and didn't hurt all those Australians that have, that have been hurt. I have sat across the table from a large number of people that have been deeply distressed, traumatised, felt stigmatised and felt humiliated that they had been accused of cheating, people in tears because of the stress of robo-debt. 
I have listened on the phone to people in tears because of the stress of robo-debt. I have had innumerable phone calls into my office that my staff have handled because of robo-debt. But not only were the government not satisfied with the fact that for two and a half years they have been running this program when they must have known they must have known that legality of this was questioned and that they were hurting people. Not only have they done that, they have continued to perpetrate this debacle on people when they know that this is hurting people. And when I asked would the government apologise, I did not get an answer. Will they apologise for the hurt and trauma that people are suffering? Because on top of them issuing these hundreds of thousands of letters on robo-debt, they have now started garnishing people's tax returns. They have started garnishing their tax returns and their family tax benefits for debts that people did not owe. The fact is the government does not know how many people have been affected by, in, by income averaging. Will they compensate people? for the trauma, the distress and hurt they have caused? Will they repay all the money that people have already paid? How many debts have people simply agreed to pay, repay, supposedly debts to repay, that they do not accept they owe but they have just given up fighting with the government because Centrelink is so hard to deal with, because they've managed to get the debt perhaps reduced a little bit and they've just lost any ability to fight any further. This is a debacle and it should stop. Thank you, Senator Seawitt. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Seawitt to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it.